Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, a collaboration between the New Art School and Design Deduct Podcast. Today's podcast is a very special podcast because we have uh, Peter Bella with us, the, who inspired me to start this podcast. So uh, it's a very special episode. Thank you so much for coming, Peter. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I don't know where I fit into your elite list of guests, so I uh, I really appreciate you having me on. It's uh, we we enjoy uh, you know the all the experts' opinions, uh, and this is what makes uh, it special. Thank you for coming. So tell us about you and your work. Uh, sure. Um, boy, I, I guess I'm, I'm multifaceted, but it comes down to me being an educator at heart. Um, so I am a full-time educator. I'm assistant professor at the University of Central Arkansas. Uh, in the past, I've taught at uh, schools such as Purdue, RIT, Buffalo State, and uh, Shepherd University. Um, but I'm also a creative and a designer. And I, I think once you've been a creator and a designer, um, you're always going to be that. It's really hard just to kind of set that behind you and move on. Um, so one of the other things that I'm also doing is I'm a, a, a creative director at a local agency uh, here in our community. And that's a lot of fun. And that's kind of on a, a consulting part-time basis. But then on another part-time basis is I run my own design uh, agency as well, where we focus on brand strategy. And uh, we do a lot of uh, videos. We're switching over now and doing a lot more um, video work than we are doing design work, you know, the, the traditional print um, style design work. Uh, so even our design work is, is primarily digital as well. But um, yeah, I've, I've been teaching for 11 going on 12 years. It's one of those things where you start losing uh, losing time of how long you've been doing it. I think we got sure. we got into the same time, 2009, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly, 2009. Yeah, yeah, so um, nice. 11, yeah, 11 years then, um, looking towards the 12th year, and um, you know, getting into getting into teaching was something that I didn't even see uh, didn't even see coming. I was a, a full time senior designer uh, doing some art direction as well. Uh, at my full-time job and I had um, a client come in and the client asked me to do a brochure and I was like well sure I mean that's kind of what we do we, we, we do those things and the client says well I want you to work on the brochure but I don't want you to do any of the work right I was like okay uh, I'm curious and uh, she said well I have four young people that um, I want you to walk through the process. I want you to let them build the brochure, create the brochure from start to finish and show them what that process is and just kind of oversee, oversee them and help them uh, build that. I was like, wow, that sounds really fun. It also sounds like it could be difficult as well and, and problematic because there's, there's so many nuances along that path that, um, Having to explain all those seemed like a lot of work to me, uh, but I had to get clearance from our uh, our director. So I, I went and seen her, and I, I talked to her a little bit, and I said, "Well, the, the client wants me to do this project, but they don't want me to do the work. They just want me to oversee some people doing the work." And she's like, "Well, as long as they're going to pay, <laughs> let's do it." <laughs> so so I went back and I I told her I says, "Well, you're." you're still paying for the project. And, you know, I, I can't get around that. Is that a problem? And she goes, Oh, no, no, not a problem at all. Um, it's kind of what I expected. So I, I said, let's do this. Um, so every meeting, every step of the way, um, consultations, critiques, teaching about the process of printing, and, uh, and, and building that brochure, I, I had a blast. So um, Fast forward, I talked to one of my old professors from my bachelor's degree, Lori Freer uh, from Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT. Um, Lori was so inspirational to me when I was a student. Um, one, of those, one of those faculty members that you stay in touch with, you know, kind of on a regular basis. So uh, every so often we'd grab lunch together. And in this particular uh, time, we, we were having lunch and I had to tell her all about that experience. And I'm like, Lori, that was, that was so much fun. I said, I couldn't believe how much fun it was, you know, um, how well the students 
were engaged, how much they wanted to, to be involved in that process and that learning. And uh, I just couldn't believe how much fun it was. I said, I couldn't believe I got paid to do that. And uh, she's like, well, that's excellent. We've been waiting for you. And I was like, what? What do you mean you've been waiting for me? And, uh, and she says, well, when you were a student, myself and Nancy, uh, uh, another one of the faculty members there, they were like, wow, he's, he's going to be an educator. He's going to come back and we're going to get him, get him started. And I was like, really, you guys were talking about that. Whatever, how many years ago it was at that time, it was probably, I think I was 12 to 15 years into my um, design career. And she's like, yeah, she goes, it took a little longer than we expected, but we, we were waiting, you know, we just felt that you were, you'd be back for that. So she said, do you want to teach a class? I said, yeah, sure. Why not? What, you know, that's fine. I, I can get paid to do that. Let's, let's try that. And obviously um, adjunct pay, um, you know, is, is not very lucrative, um, but it wasn't about the money for me at all. It was about the experience about getting behind um, the other end of the classroom you know, and teaching the students. So um, got into a class, got into a class. I was teaching one of Lori's classes. So that was um, to me very special. Um, and these were, this was a course that she designed. So one of two things, either she didn't want to teach in the evening or she really felt that I could, <laughs> that I could lead this group of students. I'm thinking of more, more or less if she didn't want to teach in the evening, um, but it was called Concept and Symbolism. And, um, and that's, that, that was the focus of the class. It was all about generating concepts, um, the importance of those concepts to the communication of the message, the importance of the concept to the audience, um, and the, the symbolic meaning behind the content that you're picking and um, how those two relate to each other. And uh, it, was a, it was a really wonderful class, had some really, really great students um, so it was a lot of fun. So I went from there to, uh, teaching two classes and then I was offered a third class and I, and I had a little bit more difficulty when it came to teaching three classes and being a full-time designer, that, that was a lot of burden. That was a lot of work. Um, so, you know, it just came to a point where I felt like I was getting burnt out from sitting behind the computer. I felt like I was um, not enjoying it as much, I guess you could say, being a full-time designer. And I, and I still design and I still love it. But I think that after the 12 or 15 years, whatever it was, um, being a designer that, well, the, the last place I, I taught full-time, the t 10 years was for the same place and it was the same material every year, just kind of redoing it, redoing it, redoing it. You know, um, I, I worked full time at, at RIT as a senior designer, um, loved, still love that university and what I put into it, but it just kind of got to a point where I felt like, you know, it was time for something new, something fresh. And the, the energy that I got from teaching was that freshness that I was looking for. So I was, um, I had to make a decision. And, and so I decided, well, what do I got to do to do this full time? And, um, you know, found out that I needed yet another degree, right? Uh, in, in the US, we need that master's degree to, uh, to, to teach. That's our terminal degree. So uh, went for it, did that, loved that experience, teaching full time. Couldn't be any more um, satisfying. Uh, to me. And it's still satisfying. But I tell you what, another 10 years, right? 10 years of doing that, 11 years of doing that, of teaching. And, you know, I, I think I, like the seven year itch, I think for me, it's 10. <laughs> so, so I'm hitting that 10 year itch of like, wow, what, what more can I do? What else is out there? Um, I'm only two years at my current university. Um, and uh, I've, I've moved quickly through a few different universities mostly because um, I was wanting to get my progress in and work towards tenure. That, that path towards tenure 
uh, is not something anyone kind of gives you the secret key to or the golden rules. Um, so for me, you know, getting that first visiting position and then getting that first assistant position or lecturing, well, I started as a lecturer, then went to a visiting, then went to an assistant. Um, and I, I moved on that path rather quickly because most universities, there's not that, that promise of, well, if you're gonna be a lecturer here, eventually you'll be tenured. Um, so my path, my goals was to um, create that as opportunity to move to that next level of teaching. So I'm only about two years away from tenure now, um, which is where I was at Purdue, but Purdue and myself, we didn't have a great fit. Uh, and now I'm at the University of Central Arkansas, which is a, a, a really great fit. I got a great colleague here. Um, interestingly enough, we are so different in our outcomes mm. and perhaps just as different in our, I'll call it ideologies or whatever you might want to say. But if you look at our methodology, our process, um, theories, passions, they're, they're so parallel, but they get such a different experience between myself and my colleague, Ray Ogar, um, that we feel it's a very special opportunity for our students. It's not a very um, down one kind of path kind mm -hmm. of look. Uh, and Ray and I have very different um, visual outcomes with our students as well as our own personal projects. Uh, so I'm, I'm loving it, right? Having a great time. But uh, I think that tenure itch is what's moved me away from, um, not away from, not at all, because I'm doing it along with, um, is, is doing that creative direction for a local agency while I'm helping the students, while I'm also um, doing my own agency and design work. Like I said, I just always need to be creating. Fantastic. What, what is your uh, role in the curriculum design? I mean, are you able to create new new, new courses or new, or new? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a long story, by the way, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah, the curriculum work is something I've always, always been very passionate about. Mm. And I think sometimes that passion could be at my detriment because um, I see so many lost opportunities, so many new opportunities uh, in structure and coursework um, that, it's, that I really kind of think about how this content is being delivered um, through what methods and how are the students even retaining it? Like what's their gathering process? And throughout my teaching, I've really learned a lot about how students learn. And I think we always will keep learning. The students today are very different than the students that I had a decade ago. Um, and they're always bringing new challenges. So that curriculum development to me uh, is, is part of that excitement of teaching. And I say that cautiously with a little pause because I know that the work that it takes to develop a class and that development for that course might work two semesters, maybe three semesters, but then suddenly there's so much change in the world, so much change in our students that you have to keep, you have to keep adjusting. And that's the thing that kind of gets to me the most is when I see an educator teaching material that's not changed. And, and you can tell, right? If you're a, if you're a, um, passionate, skilled educator, you can pick up upon um, course material that is is old or tired. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the hardest thing for me to accept. And, you know, I did, I did come across uh, a colleague in the past where the material being taught was easily 15 to 20 years behind the times. And, um, that was, that was tough. Wow. Right. And, uh, all those that are in teaching, uh, in higher education, there, there is a lot of pride amongst each and every educator. There's a lot of, um, uh, ownership, uh, and that sometimes can get in the way of, of what we should be doing as educators. And yeah. And the last thing I think that that's important to that is, um, 
it's not about me as an educator. Absolutely. It, yeah, it has nothing to do with me, and it's all about those students. Absolutely. It's all about preparing them for the moment that they shake a hand, get a piece of paper, and say that they have gotten a quality education. And the last thing that I would I would hate for is for that moment to happen for those students, for them to walk out the door and and you know start looking for work and have people looking at their portfolio and have um and have someone say, well, you know, thanks for coming by. Your stuff great, but it's not what we're looking for. You know, if if they're you know, they leave and then those those folks doing the interview, this is my this is my worry. This is what keeps me up at night. It's like, man, who taught them? <laughs> the last thing I want is for someone interviewing one of our students to actually go, wow, where did they get their education? In a bad way, right? I want them to say that in a in a very excited way, like, wow, where did you get your education? That's that's beautiful. That's wonderful. Yes, you're exactly what we're looking for. Yes, you have exactly the skills, the tool sets that we need. That's what I'm hoping for. So, <laughs> yeah, my worry is like, gosh, who who'd you learn from? Who are you, you know? <laughs> well, curriculum design. It, what gets missed is the designer skills, and what does not get missed are these fancy titles for course. You know, and what's really happened in many in many institutions is that they're not building at the core, but they're building around. But without a strong core, it's very hard. It reminds me of what uh, Michael Johnson uh, said uh, about the you know three, four, five, ten amazing ideas in the portfolio that gets immediately somebody hired. So you know, yeah, yeah. it's really sort of the you know ideas, but but also that what gets missing is 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 the is the core skills often. Yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree. Um, it, and the harder thing I think for for most universities too, or most programs, is um, one tr- don't try to be everything. Okay, you really have to kind of know who your faculty are, what are your faculty strengths, and with those strengths, what model does that allow you to build? And you have to start looking at the large picture saying after four years, what is our student, right? What can they leave here with? Because they can't leave with everything, right? Um, And then depending on the size of your your university and the size of your program, that makes it even more difficult. So then you have to break it down to, you know, what our faculty are bringing in the levels, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, and where the students have come from. A lot of our students at this university come here without any design. Some even come without any art background uh, from their high school. So um, it's really important that we start with that foundation, with that core. One of the things that I talk about highly in my uh, level one graphics class is just elements and principles of design, right? They get that in our foundation courses. They get that repeatedly, right? Uh, Line, shape, color, value, texture, right? Uh, I ask my my students in my level one graphic design class at least once a week, if not uh, every other week, um, uh, at the least amount, is uh, tell me your elements of design in order now. And they're like, uh... And I'm like, well, if you can't even think about your composition from the beginning of line in movement in direction and what that means then you know how how are you going to build a a compelling composition that speaks to speaks to someone and i talk a lot about the psychology of our mind and how important it is to understand those values Uh, i talk about the sith teens chapel and i talk about um the 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 hands of david and god oh my gosh i hope i'm getting it i hope i'm getting it right Um, and the importance of that choice that was made of that distance where they're not touching. And it really, it, it, we want to, as viewers, we want to see the connection follow through. Right. So it's just at that right point where it's close enough. We want that to happen, but it's far enough apart yet where we kind of understand that emotion and that, that what's happening in that moment. Right. So, um, you know, if you can't look at 
space and that idea of that line connecting and the importance of that um, and the power of that communication, you know? And, and so I keep bringing students back. All right, what are your elements of design? Go, tell me, right? Uh, even when we're critiquing and stuff's on the wall, if I see something that's a little bit off, spacing between two shapes, you know, I'll ask them to, to tell me that. And I'm like, okay, with that in mind, what's wrong? What's, what's missing here? And that's an important thing that's missing from a lot of coursework is instead of the faculty talking, right? Uh, I've been to so many, I have been through so many courses and I've seen so many courses that the faculty talk. I'm a talker. You guys can tell that already. Uh, Lefterius has had very little that he needed to say so far. But that is the toughest thing for me to learn that I had to learn as an educator was to shut up, basically. I had to close my mouth and actually, instead of the students asking the questions, I'm asking the questions, yeah. right? I give them material, right? I have my presentations. I don't even call them lectures anymore because it just doesn't sound exciting. I either have a, a presentation or a discussion. And, um, but after that, I'm done, right? And, um, and then I start asking the questions. Even when a student asks a question, I'm like, well, what about, what if, how can, you know, so they've got to, they've got to process them, process it themselves. And I think that's much more rewarding on a student's end to just go through a class, get straight A's and go, well, that was fun, right? What did they get from that? But when they can have the ownership, when they can dig, when they can um, answer that question themselves, then they've learned, then they've gained. Um, and that's just going to keep going. And, and if we can get them started on that, in that graphics one, graphics two level design courses, um, come their junior and senior upper level classes, they're already in that habit, right? They're already trained, even though they don't know it, to, to work those solutions out rather than you know, the instant gratification, let me ask somebody else, because I don't want to spend the time to think about it, right? So, and that's the biggest change in students today, I think, is, uh, you know, can't I push a button and get an answer? And, and the answer is, no, you, you can't. Well, since we're on the subject, you know, we are staying in our education, uh, and you've seen many, many structures of education in many places. Uh, if you could magically change something, or, or you know, what would you what would you do? What would you change or remove completely? Mm hmm, that's a great question. What would I change? I think now th th this might be um, hypocritical to say because I'm on the tenure path and I, I, I want to have, I want to achieve tenure. And I don't know if that's just to benchmark myself to say, I've done it, I've accomplished it, right? I think that's more of what, what I'm searching for out of that is to, is to know that I've completed that. But what I've seen in the past is um, when someone has that security, not just security of tenure, but security in their program, security in their university, security with their dean, um, security with their chair or having an opportunity to be, be a chair or a co-chair, whatever it might be, um, that they, for, not, I don't know if it's forget, but it seems to impede why they've become educators in the first place. And I'm not saying this is a blanket statement for all educators. But I do see um, a level of, well, well, I'm a tenured professor. And, um, and I think that's something that really kind of hurts our education. Um, and I think if, if, if people just stuck to, I love teaching, I, I, you know, I don't, the title doesn't matter. I just love teaching, you know, uh, I think that would, that would change a lot. Um, I just held a podcast interview myself for Design Dedux with uh, Mitch Goldstein of Rochester Institute of Technology. Mitch is a phenomenal guy. Um, we, you know, we we both suffer from the imposter syndrome, um, but I think that's important because we both we, we both come to our classrooms with that same uh, that same idea of you know I'm lucky to be here. You know, I'm glad to be here. I'm so fortunate to be here, and it's not about me being in this classroom. It's about those students. 
So sometimes that stature, sometimes that that title, um, not intentionally. You know, I don't think people intentionally mean to uh, forget about their passion of teaching or forget about the students. Um, but I do, I do think it gets in the way. And, and whether it's it's tenure or seniority or whatever it might be, um, you know, I, I I do see that as something. If I could change that, I would change kind of that. Um, that model. I don't know what it would be. I have, I, I have no idea what it would be. Then you was put there in order to protect the freedom of expression. So that in order that, so, so that, so that we could say whatever we wanted, regardless of the implications. And that, right. And that's really the whole purpose of tenure so that you don't say the wrong thing. And suddenly next year you have no hours or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, right. And that's that yeah. purpose. That was the original, the original purpose of tenure. And, and that, yeah, yeah. I mean, the freedom of expression, freedom, well, of, freedom, freedom of, you know, yeah. That yeah can I important aspect? Yeah. Can I um, can I touch on that for a second? I don't know how much time we have. Plenty of time. Um, time the plenty way. of time. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go back and tell you a um, a, a short story, and I hope that story doesn't ref reflect negatively upon anyone, right? Because uh, I, it's not meant to be, do that. My undergraduate studies was in a university that had a very particular vision on what they were delivering. Now, I talked earlier in the podcast about that. And I think that's great. And I think that's fine. Um, to a degree. And let me let me tell you what I mean about that. So the university that I was uh, going to was a very modernist Bauhaus style of, of I don't even know if it was of education but of an idealist way of design, meaning this is how design's done. Everything else is just not really there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I don't think they came right out and said that design is no good, but it was like, this is the right design. Everything else is everything else, right? Even Black Mountain College graduates? <laughs> yeah. And I noticed in my in my senior year that that's kind of what was happening, right? Because as a as a younger student, and I was a non traditional student, so I wasn't that young. I was in my um, uh, later twenties. Um, but I said, "Well, wait a minute." So all along here, there's been this is how you do that. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. It, it was teaching, but it was teaching a very specific way of design. And um, that's fine. That's what they chose to do. But it was in my senior year that I was like, wait a minute. Would you look at all this amazing, beautiful design out there? Um, in my undergrad classes, they talked a lot about Massimo Vanelli. Uh, and uh, Massimo was a big impact on our, on our program, for sure. And, um, but boy, in my senior year, I was like, well, look at this guy over here. Stefan Sagmeister, Sagmeister, what, what is his name? What, look at what he's doing. Uh, David Carson, and then Ed Fella. If you look at the work that Ed Fella is doing, that's not Bauhaus or modernism. I don't even know what to call that, but it was amazing, right? James Victoria, and the list goes on and on, right? Of these interesting, amazing designers doing work that's, this is still design. So, man, it, it was in that moment that I was like, gosh, I feel like I was ripped off a little bit here because I was taught how to be this designer down this little tunnel and all this other stuff outside my tunnel wasn't designed. Um, but I, I spent a lot more time looking at that world that's out there and fell in love with it. Um, and I still use inspiration from all of those great designers um, today and, and the work that they're, that they're creating and doing and who they're inspiring. And that's one thing I brought back into my classroom. The one thing I told myself as an educator, I am not going to create mini-me's. I am not going to create mini-modernists. I'm not going to create um, that type of designer. My objective is to have the student look into themselves. Um, some of the things that I do in the classroom is I have a weekly journal. Go explore. 
go find who these, I give them a list. And I tell them this list is not even an exhausted full list. Look at these people and see what they're doing and see where your passions lie. Find your path. And then I work with them about, um, and one of my biggest pet peeves is those folks that say you have to be able to, to draw to be a designer. And I'm like, you, you have to be able to communicate. You don't need to draw. And I point back to Ed Fella and I point back to James Victoria. James, if you're listening, Ed, if you're listening, you guys can draw, trust me. Okay, I'm not saying that you can't draw. But the problem is, is students look at the perception or the idea of drawing and they see like pencil sketches of realism, right? And I'm like, that's not drawing though. That's a skilled, beautiful rendering for sure. But drawing is, can you make a mark and communicate? So I, I go to the board and I draw the three primary shapes, a circle, a triangle, in a square. And I put the circle on top, the triangle next, and the square at the bottom, and they're all kind of connected sitting on top of each other. And I was like, what is it? Right? And everyone's like, well, it's a girl in a dress. And I was like, I've communicated. My job is done here. And I said, if I want, I can put two lines coming out of the side of the triangle and put two ovals on top of those two lines. And now she's carrying balloons. Right? So, and I, so students have this moment of like, their mind, their mind's blown because it's like, well, no one's ever told me that before, you know, and I says to be a good designer, it's about communication and you can communicate in the most simplest uh, with clarity and minimal stuff that it's amazing. And I think a lot of young designers have that problem of overcoming where they're in a program, they're like, well, I need to be a designer. So they, they take everything they can possibly put into their minds and their bodies about design and try to regurgitate that into whatever they're creating. And it's like, all you had to do was draw a circle, a triangle and a square and it's done. You know, but drawing as evidence of, of observation is something very different. So, so what, what, what students need to be doing is, is not to be drawing in the classical sense that you're saying, but they need to be observing and what they're not doing is observing. So there's got to be a, a way of, of, of asking them to observe because there mm-hmm. are many times that even though we are looking at the same piece of work, we're seeing two different pieces of work. So right, right. I discovered you know, really early in my teaching career that, you know, how do I make them see what is in front of, of them? And, and, and that's the whole challenge. Drawing as evidence observation is very different. And that's... yes. Yeah, and coordination, something very different. So uh, th- that's what's lacking, and for, for a lot. So that's what we need. You know, yeah, and that I and I think that's what builds into um, their creativity, mm-hmm. right? Because if 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 I did tell them, we'll draw a little girl, right? You know, at what extent would that drawing have taken, right? Versus that simple observation of with a circle that looks like somebody's head, triangle, that does look like a dress. And that square, that can represent some legs, you know? Um, so, so I think you're spot on that, you know, observing what's there, uh, being curious, right? So that observation comes out of curiosity. And if, if someone was to present that to a client, right? I'm leading to my next point of facing fears. So once you observed, once you're curious enough to kind of understand those things, uh, the other thing that stops a lot of, a lot of young designers is fear. And they're like, well, they think they must, they think to themselves, that's, that's stupid. You know, I'm not just going to do that. I'm not going to put a a red pepper on a uh, chair coaster and call it a poster for a furniture company right? Woody Pirtle's um, famous hot, uh, hot chair or hot pepper chair, whatever the name of that poster is. Um, because even, even Woody Pearl at that moment had to have that like thought of like, gosh, are people going to think that's stupid? Well, no, it's genius. It's brilliant, right? So um, a lot of students get then stopped at fear. Once they've observed and their curiosity takes them to, to an answer. And I had a student once where we were working on logos um, and, and it was more, and I told them, it's more about 
the conceptual push and the clarity and simplicity than I care about the final logo. Like, I don't care about your final logo. I do, but that's not what I wanted them to learn, right? Uh, and I talk about that in the class. They, they understand that. And he's like, well, it just seems too simple. It seems too easy. And I was like, then you've got it. If it, if it seems too simple and too easy for, for you, don't overwork it. It's there. The answer presented itself, right? You, you were observant enough and curious enough to be like, boom, I got this thing. And you feel guilty because you haven't, air quotes, worked for it, right? And uh, so that, that goes back. So many young designers kind of get too involved in, I'm a design student in a design program, and I need to... I need to live to a certain level of expectation as an artist, as a designer, right? Um, and they don't have to do that. Yeah, of, of course, of course. <clears throat> but there's also, remember, that we're also a craft. So like musicians play mm -hmm. their, their scales, yeah? Yes. The craft side of our profession needs to have a skill base, and that skill base needs cultivation. And, that, yes, and that's yes. quite hard to communicate these days. So uh, tell us about, about employment and, and the challenges of employ, for employment today. For the, for the yeah, yeah, that's something that I don't try to glorify for my students. I don't try to um, <clears throat> tell them that, you know, you're going to be an employable designer when you, when you get out of the program here. Um, they will be, but it's not... It's not that easy. And I kind of talked to them a little bit about, um, pardon me, I talked to them about, um, I guess, the odds. So I, 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 I hope that it's a motivating factor for them and not a um, mind-crushing blow uh, for them. But I tell them to think about it this way. Okay, there are jobs out there for designers, and there are so many amazing opportunities, whether you're, you're <clears throat> working for an envir environmental agency, which I have a, a, a former student <clears throat> doing that. He's a, a marketing manager, and he is their creative person in all the aspects there for an environmental agency, you know, or, or you could be doing the top like ads for Nike and Apple at some big design agency firm, everything in between. <clears throat> and there's all kinds of those jobs out there all around the world too. And I tell them if they're ambitious enough and they want to explore the world, this is a career path where they can do that. They can go anywhere in the world. And the voice of design is the voice of design, whether you're in Spain, central Arkansas and the United States, New Zealand, Australia, wherever you want to go. I say, here's the problem that you have to think about as an individual in joining this profession. We are at a university where we have a senior class that's going to be graduating. We're a small university. We're a small program. So even in our large number of students, I say, I say large, but it might be um, anywhere from 30 to 50 students. It's not a, not a huge program here, which I'm very glad to be a part of a small program. Um, that's a whole nother podcast episode. Talk about that, those opportunities. Um, you know, I tell them those are graduating seniors this year. Okay. In our town, we have five universities. Now, not all five have art programs or design in their program. So that's just locally. So if, if I move to regionally, um, we have one, two, three, four, five large universities, all with large graphic design programs. We're a BFA in studio art with an emphasis in graphic design. Mm -hmm. So we don't even have a BFA in graphic design. The other universities that we're competing with within our state all have degrees, right? That's in our state. So let's just say 50 is a round number. Now, all of a sudden, if we have, let's go with four, because that's easy math for me, because I got into art because I don't like math. And that's a whole nother discussion. Um, I talk about math all the time in my design classes. Cool. So anyhow, that's 200 students 
that are graduating or that have just graduated this spring in this state alone. And that number is probably low, in my opinion, 200. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six neighboring states. You could maybe go seven. Some of them touch just a little bit. So now if we have six times 200, that's 1,200 students if I'm doing my math correctly. And those larger programs have more students than 200. So let's just round it up to 1,500 in local states. So let's go nationwide. All of a sudden now, it looks like we're talking about 10, 20,000 students graduating in one spring semester with the ability to go into the graphic design profession or the design profession or something related to it. Um, I don't even want to think of the number if we went globally, okay? And we have in the United States plenty of plenty of graduated student, uh, students that are looking to work in the States. There are many, many designers that come to New York and Los Angeles and Chicago uh, and, and work here and do some amazing work. I know a few of them uh, personally. And um, so now I go to that one student, I'm like, how are you going to be recognized as one of those employable students? So when I have those students that kind of mediocrely work through a project or it, the day it's due, they come in, they're like, can I give it to you tomorrow? I really didn't, I, I really didn't have time to finish it. I said, remember that story that I told you way back in, in that graphics level one class? I said, where are you falling in that, in that statistical line? Yeah, you can hand it to me whenever you feel like it. That's the beauty of college. Do whatever you want to do. That's not my objective is to force you into learning or force you into doing the work. You have to decide right here, right now, where you're falling on that statistical line. Will you continue to work at a local food chain? Will you continue to try to stock the shelves at that retail establishment? Or are you going to land that job for the environmental company or for that agency doing work for Apple or Nike or Mercedes, right? Where do you want to be? And they have to make that decision. I can't, I can't make them that designer that is all of a sudden doing the, the, the ads or the marketing or the creative work for Mercedes. Nobody can make them that designer. Absolutely. If it's at the most elite school in the world or at one of the smallest programs in the world, a student can go to any university that is teaching um, art and design and be able to learn depending upon their attitude towards it. And, and that's the biggest thing to overcome. And I hope I answered your question, oh, but it did, it did I mean, go on a, um, a very personal journey for me. Yeah, yeah. But um, employment is possible. Employment is out there. There's even, even in this pandemic, right? Um, there are agencies that are closing. There are agencies that are working less. The agency that where I do the creative direction for, um, they're growing. Mm. They just added um, two people to the sales team and they added another person to their video team. And um, they need more creatives because as I'm trying to uh, work with the creative direction, you know, I've only got a handful of people to, to do work. And there was a project that I needed to hand off and I had to, figure out, well, who can take this? Or do we need another person on board to take this work? Um, and, there, and there are those agencies where they're, they're not doing as well. They're not succeeding and they're not, uh, they're not growing. They're losing clients. And uh, we just talked about a couple of clients where they're all of a sudden stopping their um, current contract under their, their current spend, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely affecting that, but um, it's an employable area, employable field. And I, and I, and I think the, the pandemic has just changed how we work. Yeah. Um, it, it's a very digital profession to begin with. So uh, I, think, I think the ability to work remotely, as long as you have the tools, um, we can pretty much work from, work from anywhere and, and do what our ambitions are from anywhere. I mean, look at our, our podcast. We're both from different spots in the world. Um, luckily, we're not like too far apart in time zones where um, you're not up at 3 a.m. <laughs> so, but yeah. 
that, yeah, that's my take on it. I can, I can digress. I'll, I'll digress. I can get really involved in that conversation. Well, you're working on some amazing project. We talked about it last time. So oh, yeah. about yeah. your projects. Sure. Um, well, I'm always keeping busy. I've already, already said that. I, I just, I just have to be creating and um, I'll, can, I'm going to be transparent and honest with you. I hate research. I despise research. Maybe despise is too powerful of a word. Um, but research is a lot of work for me. <laughs> I'm sure it's a lot of work for anyone. Um, but for me, as soon as I, I know I have to read something or have to search and search and search to find the material I want, I'm like, oh, oh, this is going to hurt. All right, here we go. And I get into it. So one of the things I wanted to create was a documentary film. And I did have a, a, a topic in mind. I'll talk about the topic in a minute. But I'm like, yeah, this is going to be a perfect opportunity and a perfect uh, medium to showcase this content I want, uh, this, this documentary film. So, and I still don't consider myself a researcher at heart. So even at my, my research as part of my promotion and tenure work, um, it has a lot more creative endeavor look to it than it does um, pure solid research to it. So I was thinking this documentary film is a, is a great way to keep my creative endeavor going. Uh, it falls right in line with my creative endeavor and my projects. But the amount of research um, that's going into this project has been um, eye-opening. Uh, and, and it's critical. It's important. I can't tell this story without the research. Um, and maybe that's what's held me back because it's been a project I've been thinking about for five years now, I think. And uh, I talk to a few colleagues about it all the time. I'm like, yeah, I got this wonderful creative endeavor idea and I, I just want to do it. And everyone's like, wow, that's a great idea. Wow, that's a great idea. And I was like, thanks. Who's going to do all the work? Because um, a documentary film, it's going to take us about two years to complete. What is the title? What is the project? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll fill you on that. So I, I did say us. So I am um, collaborating. I have a, a partner in research, I'll call her, uh, Amanda Horton. She is the um, design historian design history educator. Um, I hope I'm getting the, the, the titles at least close. Um, uh, but Mandy is out of the University of Central Oklahoma. So she's in a, a state adjacent uh, to ours. And um, I got introduced to her through Diane Gibbs, which has her own podcast, uh, Design Recharge. And uh, I had an opportunity to uh, visit and give a lecture at the University of South Alabama where Diane teaches. Um, but I got that introduction um, through another colleague who taught at a university prior to me getting to that university. Anyhow, you know, a long backstory. And I was telling Diane about the story too. And she's like, well, well, first with the podcast, he's like, well, just do it. I was like, okay. She goes, just do it. It, it was the most Again, back to the simplicity and the clarity of it. You know, I talked to her about my dream of the podcast. Her answer was, just do it. Well, okay, I guess you're right. I mean, why, why, what's holding me back? What, what are those fears, right, that are holding me back? Um, so then a further conversation, I talked to her about this documentary film, and she's like, well, just do it. She goes, if nobody else is doing it, and you, and you have the idea, and you, you want to do it, just do it. So I'm, that's why I'm doing it. So anyhow, um, Mandy, Amanda Horton, Mandy, um, I reached out to her through a suggestion from Diane Gibbs to uh, see if she's interested in collaborating on the project with me. So uh, we are doing a documentary film and the documentary film is on women uh, of graphic design in America. And um, there, there's women in graphic design all around the globe throughout some amazing, amazing um, places with outstanding work. And one of the things we had to realize was we can't, like, it's so big, right? And um, the history aspect of it is what kind of got me interested in it. Because I had, you know, I teach history of graphic design and actually curriculum development. I developed that course for the university I'm at now. So that, and, and as a matter of fact, I did that for Purdue as well. Um, and one of the things that 
we talk about is the information that's out there, what's in the history books. And the history books do talk about women designers um, from Beatrice Ward to the Glasgow Girls to Paula Shear, um, maybe some in between, some Barbara Kruger or something like that, right? Some April Greenman. Um, but it just kind of says that these women were out there and these women did design and they did this thing, right? But it doesn't really talk much in depth about it. It doesn't talk about the journey. It doesn't talk about the struggles that they, they had to overcome to even be recognized as a woman designer, right? Most women designers uh, were put in the production room and paste up floors and typesetting. Um, but we know that there are some amazing women designers out there throughout history. But that's not really talked about to its degree of importance in our history books. Here's an interesting caveat, caveat, aspect, irony, I don't know. Um, we are going to be interviewing and talking with Elizabeth Meggs, which is the daughter of Philip Meggs, and uh, her mom, uh, Libby Meggs. And um, Libby Meggs, the wife of Philip Meggs, of the author of uh, Graphic Design History, uh, in its sixth edition, going to the seventh edition, Libby was responsible for the Virginia is for Lovers campaign, right? That was one of the U.S.'s biggest campaigns in the 70s. I remember as a kid, you know, Virginia is for Lovers and all the commercials and the, and the uh, magazine ads and stuff. It was phenomenal. It was brilliant. Um, but do we hear about who was behind that, right? Do we, do we know that it was Libby Meggs, which is the wife of this amazing graphic design historian? that put together this beautiful text that so many of us use as the foundation. Interestingly enough, as uh, Elizabeth asked us to reach out and engage with Sandra Max, Maxa, Maxa, I think, uh, hope, I'm bad with names, I, I apologize. Uh, but Sandra is going to be writing the seventh edition uh, or editing the seventh, revising, right? So now we have the voice of a, a woman historian in that text. So this documentary film, I just felt it was so critical to be sure that I was looking to a female design historian really? to help me tell this story. Because who, you know, left here is who am I, right? Who, who am I? So it goes back to maybe the imposter syndrome or it's not about me, right? It's about what I need to tell or what needs to be told, not even what I need to tell. And um, I had, was in a, um, a Zoom meeting with a bunch of design historians and uh, we were asked, Mandy and I were asked to discuss this idea of this documentary film with, with that group. And I had, I, I was challenged. I did have a female design historian, which I think there was only two males, myself and another, and another male in that meeting, where one of those um, design historians said, why you? And I, and I, I honestly, I says, you know, I was waiting for the question and I don't really have an answer, but my answer is why not me? She goes, do you think it's right for, and, and, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't know exactly how she posed the question. She goes, do you think it's right for you as a male to be telling the story of female designers? Uh, and I said, I don't know. I don't know if it's right. I says, but it's not, it's not happening. I wanna make it happen. So why not me, right? And um, when I told Mandy that, in a previous discussion that Mandy and I had, she's like, yeah, she goes, that's fine with me. She goes, you know, we, the story needs to be told no matter who kind of tells that story. I'm just feeling that it's a great, I'm so fortunate. This is such an opportunity for me. And I feel honored and privileged that I'm working on that project. This isn't, you know, my project. It's not Mandy's project. It's, it's our project, right? Our as designers, right? And getting that story out there. So the documentary film is going to be coming out. It's going to be called Redesigning Her Story. Fantastic. And uh, the the tagline is Women of Graphic Design in America. Brilliant. And um, we have an amazing all-female design agency creating our visuals for it. And we're going to be having a meeting coming up with them to talk about how that's coming. Uh, Nina Stossinger which is from Germany. And she works here in the United States in New York with uh, Tobias Farrah Jones at his agency. She has a typeface that she designed where she's submitting that 
as the typeface that's going to be used on the visual identity. Um, we're going to be talking with, and we've already had some uh, interviews already, um, Ellen Lupton, um, Ruki, and Ruki, I apologize, but trying to say Ruki's last name, but she's the one of the curators and uh, lead people at the uh, education, oh my gosh, Lepteris, I, I should have probably wrote all that down, um, at the Cooper Hewitt. Smithsonian Museum um, for Design Education. Um, Gail Anderson, Jennifer Morella, I've already mentioned Elizabeth and Libby Meggs, um, April Greenman, if I've not mentioned that already, Susan Carr. Um, it's such an, a, an extensive list. But we're also talking with these young folks from, from just any old design school. Carrie Smith, I say any old design school, but they'd be like, what? That's my alumni. Or those faculty members would be like, we're not any old design school. Um, one of those is one of our graduates from the University of Central Oklahoma. Her name is uh, Michelle Underwood. She's in Chicago. Um, Carrie Smith, with a, which I just mentioned, is in Los Angeles working for a record company, uh, working on a lot of their visuals. So we're, we're not just focused on the legends, we're focused on women of design, women of design from times gone by and those that have left us and left their legacy to women designers that are just starting out. And, you know, we're looking at what that story is and, and how these pioneers in design have changed, changed the path for women designers. Mm. If we look in the classroom today, how many, you know, what's the ratio of, of male to female in the United States? It's about, you know, um, if we take 10 students, it's probably an eight to two or a seven to three, um, where the majority of the 70 to 80% are female uh, students. So design has changed. And, and for sure, we want to tell that story of women in graphic design. Fantastic. That's honestly, yeah. That's Redesigning her story. I think that is looking at a release date. It's about 2022. Um, we're in the very early stages. The pandemic has, has, has put such a hiccup in our plans. We were, Starting filming this summer, we had uh, scheduled to start in May uh, in New York City and uh, in Baltimore, uh, Maryland at MICA. And um, yeah, the, the pandemic, and we had everything scheduled and now we don't. So what we're doing is we're, we're doing a lot of podcast uh, discussions right now with the folks that we're going to be interviewing in the film, not to talk about the issue of women in graphic design, um, you know, we're saving that content for the film, but what we're talking about is um, what we should be aware of. What should we be looking for? What should we be avoiding? Uh, we talk about them and their work. Um, so we're, we're, we're finding a separation between the podcast and kind of using that as teaser uh, material and, and really strong content <clears throat> for women in design and those designers, but saving... Um, saving the heart and soul of what the documentary film is supposed to be for the documentary. Brilliant. Brilliant. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Oh boy. Um, you can find me on the web, uh, of course, right? Social media. So um, PeteBella.com is my personal uh, website where they can kind of look at um, a funny picture of me and some information about my research and my CV and my accomplishments as far as academics go. Um, you could follow my Instagram account if you want, uh, but that's a lot more random about my real life. <laughs> um, so that is, uh, Pete Bella Jr., Pete Bella Jr. Um, and I believe it's the same on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't, I don't tweet much. I, I just have a hard time, like trying to keep up with it all. Um, but my Instagram, you can see me, uh, drinking coffee. You can see me, uh, imagining I'm in a Star Wars film, <laughs> you could see me in the great outdoors. Um, it's one of the things that have changed for me is uh, getting outside and, and getting into nature. Uh, and if if anyone can follow Lepterius on Instagram, because Lepterius is just making some amazing um, still life grabs of nature through the lens of his camera that are just stunning. Um, I want to hit like and love on every single one of them, but I'm like, am I being a stalker? <laughs> so so yeah so i'm out there i'm on the web uh i'm i'm working on my my agency and developing that so we're in a transition so if you went to twistcreativestudio.com uh, you're just going to see an under construction page right now 
um, cause we're rebuilding that, but, uh, uh, peepellet.com for all the academic stuff. Um, and I have, of course, that faculty bio at uh, uca.edu for the University of Central Arkansas. Fantastic. Yeah. Any last piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? Uh, yeah. The, the first thing, the quick thing that comes to mind is don't overthink it. And, and I might, that might be too simple, but that's just the beauty in it, mm. right? Yeah. Don't overthink it. Um, it. If if it if it's there and it presents itself, it presented itself for a reason. Um, if there's certainty, if there's clarity, if there's confidence, don't overthink it. Um, I've already said too often how I see students overthinking it and over designing and over pushing, over conceptualizing. Um, I like to say it's not that hard, but when I say that to students, they laugh at me and they're like, but you've been doing this for, I don't know, 30 years or so, right? And I'm like, well, maybe that's a part of it. Um, but I, yeah, I just think don't, don't overthink it. Um, simplicity, clarity. Um, it, if it's, if it's communicating, if, if it's, if it's coming to you, if it's working, you know, let that, let that live. It might not always be perfect. And uh, perfect is a very difficult thing to strive towards and, and strive to be. Um, let that, let it be what it is. And um, don't worry yourself too much on it. We're all human beings and we all face those same fears and challenges um, <clears throat> alike. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. It's oh, you're welcome. <clears throat> I appreciate you wanting to listen. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your 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 expression really and your and your ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. All right. That's Take it. care, Lepteries. Bye. Bye.